Hello everybody and welcome back as promised to episode 10 of Space is Hard Vacuum with Cerberus where today we are going to, among other things, launch this bad boy up into a polar orbit. I believe this is an uprated version of my old Stiletto 1 launch vehicle. I'm going to be putting a, a new version of my ComSat design with some better equipment up into orbit just to kind of help fill one of the gaps that I've got in the still kind of piecemeal network. As you can see here, we are for, I believe, the first time in this series launching from the Kodiak uh, launch location up in Alaska, mostly just because we can. Uh, really, uh, Plisetsk over in Russia is probably better for launching into polar orbits because it is itself closer to the pole, but uh, we will make it work anyway, and just for a little bit of variety. But things start going not so well on the first attempt on this launch. It all starts out with me kind of being a bit of an idiot and trying to point the rocket to a heading of 90 rather than zero, forgetting that we're doing a polar orbit here, not an equatorial or even slightly inclined one. Or And then it just, from that point, it really just can't get back into pointing the right way and I help it out a little bit with a bit of time warp and then it's you know okay it's it's almost it's almost doable fire the ullage motor but then because it's still spinning and wobbling by the time I try to fire up the second stage it's already gone unstable fuel flow wise so it doesn't light up and we try again and that whole first part of the launch goes fine and we continue on from there on the second attempt getting this guy into orbit. We establish the 12.5 megameter apoapsis and then uneventfully enough we get up there, fire up the little engine on the satellite, circularize, and there we are. That's a ComSat Mark III design now into orbit, so we've got four low orbit satellites. And here we're revisiting the ComSat Mark I because I'm going to base that design, or base from that design, for the ComSat Mark IV. And while I'm at it, I take that launch vehicle, which I had forgotten to ever make a subassembly out of, and I go ahead and do that, and I call it the Bayonet 1, because that's kind of just what came to mind at the time. And then since we're going to use, I'm going to use all that same stuff, RCS thrusters and the antennas and whatnot, but... Now I have access to this Luna 1 probe core, which I didn't have access to before. It's a little bit lighter than the Sputnik 1, while also not having its own integrated radio antenna. And the nice thing about that is that it will allow the add-on omnidirectional antennas that I stick on there to kind of have their full effect. So I, I, I'm not going to use... I, I can save on using f two of them instead of four, which is pretty significant because they mass about 20 kilograms apiece. And on a satellite, which, you know, I think when it's finished is going to mass about 400, being able to save 40 is pretty significant. So I bring that down to the two time symmetry and you see I'm kind of rearranging everything to make sure it all fits. Uh, so the major differences here between the ComSat Mark 1 and what will be the ComSat Mark 4, like I said, we save some mass by dropping a couple antennas, we save some mass by using smaller RCS thrusters, we switch from the Sputnik probe core to the Luna 1 core, and then we make use of those wonderful new swiveling solar panels so that I will hopefully never again run into the problem of facing the thing the wrong way to make a maneuver and then running out of electricity. And after a bunch of RCS thruster torque balancing, which I skipped for all of your benefit, now we get to tweaking out the launch vehicle, which is itself kind of old. We retrofit the upper stage with some RCS to make it a little bit more controllable. And then we're also going to, uh, right, I'm going to add in a new feature that I've started using on my rockets where I kind of have a new separation system. You can see here, 
You can see how to make it if you're curious. I'm certainly not the first person to come up with it, but you just take some separatrons, turn them upside down, and kind of rotate them almost inside out, you could say, so that they sit inside the fairing, just like so. Now that first stage will drop away very nicely when I, uh, when I stage it off. And if you're really picky like me, you can mess around with trying to make it look as close to hidden inside the fairing as possible, but that's not necessary. So then, having updated all the engines to tech level 3, and done those extra tweaks to the launch rocket, and also ditched those great big solid boosters you'll see, I resave it as the Bayonet 1. No sense calling it the Bayonet 2, when really it's... I just upgraded it. Made it more powerful, and off we go to send the Mark IV ComSat. The goal being up into a geostationary orbit, same as my Mark I ComSat. So this way there will be uh, there'll be two of them, just to give that much better of a chance of having coverage from it while in orbit. Generally speaking, with the power of the antennas on the ground as well as on my low orbit ComSats, usually I do pretty good, but. Um, one important purpose, which will be used a bit more in later episodes for these geostationary ones, is that with those dish antennas, they can point one, or they can target uh, Earth with one, and then an active vessel with the other, and they have the range to communicate between Earth and the Moon. Which we saw when I sent the maple probe there. We were uh, maintaining communication thanks to that first geostationary satellite, and so now I'm just going to have a second one up there just to make things a little safer and uh, make my communication network a little more robust. As you can see here, this launch went a little shallow. <laughs> we're getting, now you really see, for at least a few moments, we get some, some de-entry effects, as I like to call it, when that happens. Um, Definitely more shallow than I'd intended, but already we're past kind of the point of danger. Things are cooling back down. Dynamic pressure is not very high because the air is so thin. So we uh, we survived that one, and we are, by the way, also launching from uh, French Guiana, basically with the European Space Agency's kind of primary launch site, Kourou because this one we want to have... Honestly, it doesn't have to be on a perfectly equatorial orbit. It's not necessarily needing to be perfectly geostationary, but I want it to be close. And that launch site is five degrees north of the equator, which makes it great for that kind of thing. And there it goes, look at that. <laughs> it doesn't drop away, it really motors away. And after... A little bit of skipping there as well. I had to fire the RCS thrusters for about 40 seconds um, just to properly ullage that top stage tank to give stable enough fuel flow to let that upper stage motor actually work. But I had lots of RCS fuel and I was able to do that and you know onward and upward literally because we still have a lot of orbit making left to do because we're only just now at 140 kilometers. Like I said, it was a very shallow orbit profile. However, we uh, we will definitely make it. We've got the power. Just need to point a little bit upward um, above our prograde direction, just to just to help boost that vertical velocity back up. Because if we don't do that, then we won't make it into orbit, and then we'll just have to have to try again. However. I can happy to report that that ends up not being needed and once I get the vertical velocity stabilized and climbing again I also turn um, slightly northward to a heading I think of about 75 degrees because after having been pointing at 110 to increase our inclination and get us down near the equator more quickly now I need to kind of, you know, I have to turn northward to cancel out that velocity again. I want to stop moving south 
when I get near the equator so that I can be on as close to a zero degree inclined orbit as possible. And you know, we get it, we get it pretty close this time, just as the second stage motor burns out. And then I have all this high test peroxide left over in that tank for uh, RCS purposes. So might as well use it up too. Any impulse is good impulse. And then we, we let it go, deploy the satellite proper, get its solar panels going so that we don't run out of power. <laughs> That's about the only thing that'll keep me from running out of power at this point. And then we uh, finish establishing that orbit. Or at least we finish establishing the top side of our orbit. And I overdo it a little bit there. I, I go just a little past 35,786. And then I get up there and I think, well, you know, I, I raise the periapsis first, of course, to 200 kilometers, just so that I'm actually orbital. Then I get up there again, and I think, well, why don't I fix my apoapsis at periapsis? Because, you know, that's actually kind of the efficient and smart way to do it. So I fall back down there again, uh, bring the apoapsis down to actually, you know, or as close to 35,786 as I can. And then... Uh, from there, the orbit itself is, the intermediate orbit is established, and now we can sit here as many times as we want, go around and around and around, until that other satellite, which you see there, is quite close now. But now, after going around one more complete orbit, we see that com geostationary ComSat-1 is just about directly across uh, the Earth from us. It's not perfectly so, but it's basically... You know, it's probably, I don't know, it's 170 degrees, or maybe even a little better, 175 degrees around the circle of our orbit from us right now, so that's good enough for me. We got pretty good coverage. One satellite will look at this side of the Earth, the other satellite will look at, obviously, the other side of the Earth, and so we'll, we'll circularize now. Does not need to be exact. Just needs to be, for, for these purposes, close. Um, because, of course, the cone angle on these dish satellites is like 25 degrees, so I don't need to point directly at the equator. I just need to be able to see the Earth. So we assign that one in the name of Geostationary ComSat 2. And this, I believe, is, at least for you guys, an, the inaugural flight of a brand new launch vehicle. A uh, brand new, I guess, a launch vehicle family. This is actually kind of going to be a launch vehicle family. This is uh, the family, I suppose, we'll call the, the Scimitar 2. The Scimitar 1... I actually forget what I launched with the Scimitar 1. I forget what that carried. <laughs> but the Scimitar 2 is, of course, a little bigger. This is all 3 meter diameter uh, tanks and engines. And what it is going to do for us as we climb into the sky over Plesetsk, so you have a bit of a clue there, we are doing a polar orbit this time. Uh, not that I expect you guys to recognize that as being Russia, <laughs> but it is. It's Plesetsk in Russia, and we're putting this into a polar orbit. And uh, with the size of that rocket, you may also be able to guess that we're going into a fairly high orbit. Uh, we are staying in orbit of Earth, but uh, this is uh, enshrouded, in, I suppose is a good word, in that uh, nose fairing up the top is another satellite, again, but this one is going to be for future use for our interplanetary missions. It is going to, it's got a high power main communications dish with uh, sufficient range, I believe, to communicate with probes that we will, as I keep saying, one day <laughs> send to Venus and or Mars. It might work for a Mercury probe too, I'd have to check. So in any case, we uh, we start a bit of a a, uh, a dog leg turn, I suppose, because, you know, again, it's, it's not... While Plesetsk is a good place to launch into polar orbits from, it's not perfect, because you are not launching from a pole, so we do have to at least it's a lot better to get our inclination up to 90 
while we're going slower rather than faster. Because the faster we're going, the harder it is to, you know, change the direction of our velocity. And uh, that roll that you see the rocket doing is not my doing, although that is me now trying to counter it. Uh, as it turns out, it looks like we have a slight issue with the flight computer or instrumentation pack on the Scimitar 2 launch vehicle. And we have reason to believe that it affects all the members of the vehicle family, which maybe doesn't bode well. Uh, definitely going to merit some review at a later time when we go over the telemetry and have a look and see what it is that goes wrong because that's definitely a bug that we'll want to fix before we keep trying to launch stuff with this rocket family. As it is right now though, with, with some semi-manual control we're able to keep it under wraps and we're still a go to continue with the mission to get this satellite up in the orbit. Still nothing catastrophically bad has happened yet, which is always nice. We've actually overshot a little here, so we straighten out and then we're going to try, if we can, if we can control this thing well enough, bring our heading back to less than 180 degrees to bring our inclination back down towards 90. We want to get it as close as we can. Again, not necessarily because it has to be, more so just because I want it to be. And we're having a few more issues again with the upper stage here. Uh, not really so much with the stage itself, but because of the fact that it doesn't really have roll control. It's got some with those RCS thrusters, which are actually on the third stage. Uh, so they'll help, but really uh, we get some issues there because by the time this stage becomes active, it's not supposed to be rolling. And that caused some serious problems with trying to keep it flying straight. Because uh, as I'm sure any of you who had this problem will know, trying to control the up, down, left, right orientation of something which is spinning is kind of difficult. In any case, though, we get it more or less stable and we get it back onto its pro-grade trajectory. Um, so again, we're still going. Another, another issue there that's definitely going to merit some, uh, some further research, but as it is, we're still maybe just lucky, maybe good, maybe both, but in any case, we are definitely still on the mission. Things are still working out just fine. So now that we've kind of at least worked around a bit of the wobbling, rolling issue, now we can finally, a little later than we'd want to, but we can fix that orientation, that inclination. Second stage burns out and we ditch it away in very ceremonious separatron powered fashion. Third stage ignition and everything now is looking pretty good. So the third stage, at least so far, this being about, you know, 20 seconds into the first time it's ever been used, seems to work like a charm. But, uh, and you know, the second stage doesn't really appear to have any major problems either. Um, but either the, either the engines or the gimbals on the first stage itself, or just, you know, again, the instrumentation and computer, maybe there's a computer bug in the instrument pack in there somewhere, which, uh, the boys back at mission control, the engineers, the smart ones, unlike me, I just press buttons and tell the rocket to do things. The smart people down there somewhere are going to have to figure out what it is that's going on. And at this point, I actually shut off the third stage engine because I think I look at the amount of delta V I have left. I have an idea of about how much it's going to take me to get this into the orbit I want. And then I use maneuver nodes and a little bit of mental math to figure out that this is either going to cut it very close or I'm actually not going to be able to do it now. And by that, I mean, if I had just continued on burning from here until establishing the apoapsis of 100,000 kilometers and then circularizing whenever I got there. Uh, if I was going to have enough fuel left, it was going to be very, very close. 
and either way I didn't like the margin. So instead I decide that we're just going to maintain this orbit, come around once, uh, and when we get back to periapsis, which just so happens to be almost directly over the North Pole, which gives us a really neat uh, cruise over low over Earth's North Pole, which I think looks really cool with the sun being at that angle and whatnot. I believe it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere right now. And, you know, even with the terribly stretched textures <laughs> on the North Pole of the Earth right now, I still think it's a really cool view. So we fire it up and we finish uh, establishing our apogee of 100,000 kilometers while we're down here just 200 kilometers over the North Pole. Look at this. If you just saw the nav ball there sort of flip as I was suddenly switched from approximately a heading of zero to a heading of 180. And uh, that's done. And automatically we orient to the new direction for the next maneuver because it was already put into the flight computer. And by flight computer, I suppose I should say mech jab. I don't use the flight computer in remote tech. And there we go. That's it. Third stage is all done with. At a slightly different orbit than the 100 by 100,000, I should say. 100,000 by 100,000 kilometer orbit. So after some adjustments with the little engine and RCS thrusters on the satellite itself, we are just about done with the orbit. We have pretty close to a perfectly circular 100,000 kilometer orbit, which incidentally has a period at, of just about four days, which uh, was just kind of a neat thing that I had no idea of, and uh, it's just kind of cool that it came out to a nice even kind of round number like that. And that is, uh, that is it for that successful enough launch. And so we decide to go ahead anyway with the plan to launch a test of uh, the Venture 3 mission where Jeb is going to take that command pod. And there's actually a little service module under there we're testing as well. But we get the rocket up onto the launch pad and Jeb reports some catastrophic major failures of the uh, flight computers, several of the information displays on there, and it's decided that we are no-go for the mission because that kind of confirms our suspicions that there are some serious issues with the instrumentation on the Scimitar 2 launch vehicle. So, in the interest of safety, we, uh, we decide that the mission is not going to be a go and we're just going to have to try again later after uh, after we pass it off to the engineers to get a little work done on that flight computer and hopefully get that all fixed up for us. So that does it for episode 10. Uh, I will simply have to promise Mars and or Venus probes in a future episode yet again. I think this is the fourth time straight I've said, yeah, next time we'll do it. Except this time I'm not saying next time we'll do it. I don't know that we'll get this get to that in the next episode um, because in other news I blew the transfer window <laughs> to go to Mars and we won't see another one of those for about two years of game time uh, there is one coming up however for Mercury so I might just slap a bunch of stock science instruments onto a probe and see if I can send one to Mercury and maybe that's one option for what we can do next uh, the definite option though of one thing we're certainly going to do is that Venture 3 mission. We're going to try to get Jeb into a high orbit, collect some science with some stock instruments there, hopefully bring him home safe. Until then, I am Cerberus, and we'll see you next time.